right. So, all right. So here's our main page. As y'all can see, when you get to your medical training, you'll come down, um, you can drop on the box, Aries Virtual Classroom, and then it pops to this page. Here is your attendance form, okay? Your class, it just disappears. There's your class, uh, attend your class pin, which is actually gonna be attendance code. It is the same exact thing, that is fine. All right, so here's what we need to see that's important, guys. So today's date. So today is, I don't even know, the fourth. So if you watch this video, let's say you're not able to make it tonight, but you watch the recorded video on the 5th. So I would come right here and I would put today's 5th and I need to know what the original lecture date was. So what that does is it lets us know that you were able to watch this in the, right, in the, amount of, the correct amount of time. Oh, I don't remember where some of this stuff was because I haven't messed with this screen in quite a while. All right, so there we go. All right, you see I'm showing y'all all my secrets. I can mute y'all and unmute you when I want to. All right, so your class pin goes right here. I will show that at the very end of every class. And then I expect to have legible signatures every time. I'm just kidding. So you will do like an electronic signature through here. You'll sign your name. See, that's Chris Wally. Y'all don't really know that, but that's what I'm writing. So anyway. So, and then once you do all that stuff, you will enter the information and that email is sent to Rob's email. And he knows every single time, I'm just kidding. So this will be logged into our stuff. So we know who's taking what, when they're taking it. Um, so that's how you would do your attendance. Now, I know I asked that question. So, um, so that question was asked to me. So I wanted to make sure you showed that. So now I want to go to... Um, sorry, I'm having my, there we go right there. So I'm going to show you all JB learning. All right. So when obviously y'all are going to log in completely different, uh, cause mine's going to show up all sorts of different things. But when you go to the JB learning class, um, you'll click on your exact class and please make sure that it's the two alpha 32 alpha three. Uh, that is your class code. Uh, make sure I'll back up and show you off. I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. So whatever classes you will have assigned on your screen will be populated here. Um, I can hide these that are not being used, but this is the class that we're going to use. Please make sure that it is 2 alpha, 32 alpha 3, and that's the class we're going to click on. So not tonight. You, you will not be able to take your chapter test tonight because I got to go in there and do some work. Um, you will have, oh, okay, well, it's not secure, but we're going to keep going. Mine, I, I had to put some stuff on my uh, my computer, so that's fine. All right, so this is what your JB Learning is going to look like. This is your Navigate. Um, you're going to have access to all of these different chapters. As you can see, what is in Mod 1, so you'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And then that is what we compose of module one. Uh, module one, you will have a test on all the uh, chapters for module one. Each night, um, so let's say tonight we're gonna do EMS system. Click on chapter one. Here's all the different things that you have that you will be able to look from. Um, when you scroll down to here, you will click on chapter one quiz. Obviously, you will not be able to do that tonight because you do not have access to, access to it because you can see right here, it closed on December 23rd. I have to go in there and make some changes. That's on me. Um, so tomorrow, I'll have some, a lot of things fixed and better off. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to make sure I check up on the, the messages. I saw it pop up on my screen. All right, so once we do that, once we situate it, your class um, is scheduled from 6 to 10 every night, every Tuesdays and Thursdays. At 10 o'clock, your test will open up for that module. So if you wait till tomorrow to take the test, that's not a problem. I don't care, but you get three days. So for Tuesday's class, you get Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, okay? On Friday at midnight, that class lecture will close. OK, you will not be able to take that. OK, for some odd reason, if you decide, hey, look, uh, 
was unable to take it that night, I am aware. You need to let me know that I'm going to, I don't know who, since my screen's on the wrong side. Let's say Rob is unable to attend tonight's class. He's going to let me know. And then what I can do is I can individually go in there and allow him extra date. So if he, if I know he's going to attend, he's not able to attend it. So I will set the class on Wednesday. So he'll have Thursday, Friday, Saturday to take the test. So that is the way that helps me understand. And then I can see, oh, wait, did they, did they log in to, uh, um, to Zoom? Well, you know, so there's a lot of different things that we can see through here. So when we go through chat, chapter two, it is the same exact way. This will show you how much progress that you've done through here. So if you're able to log in and go through EMS chapter one, you will have access to different parts of these. You have your ebook, you'll have flashcards, you'll have an audio book, which is probably a lot better sounding than me. And if it is, please don't tell me. Y'all just say, Chris, you're great. And I'm going to be happy with that. So it'll actually give you um, different uh, percentages on what you've completed. And then once that's completed, this right, the little percentage part will increase, obviously. Um, you will, y'all will not see this. I do want to show y'all something that is important on this side. So over here, we have upcoming um, events. Uh, if you look at it on your screen and you kept wondering what this little circle is, a little arrow, click that. This will tell you different dates, different times. Um, you will also have um, once in a blue moon, you will, uh, it will not auto populate as into who's a, uh, Whoops, sorry, that's not what I wanted. Uh, I was trying to bring my camera back up, but there it is. So it will not populate as into um, what's being shown over here, but you will have uh, key topics. Uh, your key topics is not mandatory. Um, it will be on upcoming popular things that are, that are happening in the EMS world today. Um, what that is doing, uh, it was, you will be allowed to either write an essay on it, answer the questions, uh, formulate uh, some chat between whoever tries to participate into that extra credit. And that will be given extra credit. Um, so what that is on extra credit, I allow you to give up to, let's say, sometimes it's 20 points is the max. If you have four, let's say you have four chapters and a module. So you can divide it up to five, 10, 15, 25 points to each but you can only give 10 points max per module. So let's say you didn't do so good on module two or, mo or chapter two or chapter three. That being said is you can add 10 points to your grade off of chapter two and chapter three if you participate into the hot topic. Um, a lot of times there may not be one because there may not be an upcoming topic uh, for EMS. So that, that's some of the, the downfall that I try to stay uh, pretty, up to date on. But the good thing is, is everything revolves around COVID right now. Um, since the flu was gone, that uh, we've eradicated that, we probably will get a lot of topics on uh, thoughts and considerations on flu, I mean, uh, COVID stuff, um, just on how to function out uh, what we say is the now is the new real world. Uh, let's see this last message. All right, Rob got that. All right, so I can't show you any of this because this is all instructor stuff over here. Um, but these are your modules. As you can see, it goes pretty in depth. And so your final exam, that encompasses, I think we did 100 questions on uh, all of the chapters. Um, so that is it's very challenging on uh, myself and Rob for us to sit down and make your final exam. Um, so your questions, uh, um, people ask about this, uh, uh, how your questions are. So we, instead of us sitting down and writing out the questions, so we take a, um, just, we choose, randomly choose um, 10 questions because there's 10 chapters, 10 questions per chapter test. I want the computer to randomly generate 10 questions out of the EMS systems test bank that JB Learning has. So what that does is it, it eliminates personal, personal error that I may have. 
and I just type the sentence out right, or did I actually cover it? Well, anything that's in EMS chap, EMS systems can be tested on. So we highly encourage you to read your book, um, ask questions, make sure that you just understand what's going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I do that a lot. Uh, I, I yawn a lot. Uh, I end up drinking a lot during the class. No matter what, I'm gonna yawn. I think it's because I talk. My wife's over here laughing, and making fun of me. But sometimes things get me and I'll just start yawning for like 10 minutes or it's, it's very annoying. I don't know why that happened. So that is JB Learning. Does anybody have any questions on that right there? Rob, do you wanna add anything or about that? Um, you know, just some, a word on the uh, test. So we had the, the final exam that you talked about that will get you through this course. Um, the test that really matters that everybody's got to worry about at the end is the National Registry. That's what you have to pass to actually get your certification. Um, we have one more test that we're kind of putting in the middle of, you know, after the final exam, but before you go to take the registry, that is called the HESI. You will have to pass that test with at least a 600 before you go take the registry itself. Um, it, the good thing about it is, is it's a lot cheaper. First of all, we're gonna cover your first attempt at the HES. That's just, you know, it's part of your tuition. But um, it's much, it, it, if you wind up needing to take it multiple times, it's much better to have to do that one multiple times than the registry, because the registry itself, first of all, you only get so many attempts. Secondly, each attempt is expensive. I mean, you can easily, by the time you run out of attempts in the registry, you've actually almost met your whole tuition all over again because of the cost of the test. So I don't want to drain your bank accounts. I don't want you to keep, you know, I want you to go to the registry, take it once and be done with it because that test is not easy. Um, so just so you know, you'll finish the course. Then we set you up to do the HESI. Uh, and the cool thing about the HESI too is that it will actually tell you where you're struggling. So you've got this whole book. If you've got anybody that's bought one of these books on paper, it's thick it's it's the thick thick book how do you know what you need to work on so the HESI actually helps you with that it breaks it down based on your answers hey you need to focus on this this don't worry about these you got that that kind of thing whereas the registry just says pass or fail um so this is all an attempt to help kind of get you prepared for that test so that you can go in take the registry once and then be done with it uh, we also will have other things to kind of help out. You guys are all going to get access to Guardian Test Prep, which is good for tutoring as well as test prep itself for the registry. So, you know, this will also help get everybody set to where you can go take that test one time and be done with it. That's, that's our goal is that you don't need six attempts to take the test, even though some people, some people take six attempts. It happens. But that's all. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry, I was laughing at my wife. Uh, no, so, and, you know, to go off of the HESI is, it, we say 600 points, but that's because we know that that's what passes registry, but at the same time, it's, their grading system uh, is different, so you're not like, oh my God, that's a point per, you know, question. No, um, that's something if you guys want to know more details about on the HESI system, I am not up to speed as, as of like Rob is, but please let him know and he can explain some more to it, or you can actually even do some Googling. Um, I, I uh, need to get better at learning about the system, but we we push that because it is a very good system and it helps you average and know what you need to what you need to go back and study on. Um, it's a very good tool. Uh, Rob's taken that before, and uh, right, Rob, didn't you have you use that? Yeah, it's not an easy test either, but it's it's much more. You get a lot more out of it. So. Um, so, so that's that. So here we are is JB Learning. Um, please log into it. If you, from the looks of everybody that's in the class versus who I have as participants, not everybody has either bought a book yet, got the access code through our website. Please, please here, let me say this first. If you're going to buy a book, I understand majority of people want to go through and buy the cheap book. I, I get it. But not all the time is cheap because through our website gives you a code that gains you access to JB Learning. If for some odd reason you buy that book off of Amazon because it's the same one, I can get it for $19.99. That's fine. Not a problem. You still have to pay for an access code through our website. That's why we try to push to go through the website to get the book because you get the book and the access code. Because everything I do, uh, everything I will test you guys, everything else will be through here. Uh, you 
don't really physically have to send me anything uh, by email. Um, I, I'm not going to send you a test to print out and take the test in the back. I mean, just not because that's that's what you're going to do through here. So we've had that happen in the past and we've it's been a pain. So please understand that's why we push hard and heavy. Thank you so much about um, buying that through there. Um, just for y'all, if y'all don't know, Rob's glad to see that. Oh, Miss Fan, just because there'll be a lot of those jokes throughout here and there. Um, so that's kind of, uh, so let's do this since this is in my face. So this right here, the, EN, the NREMT skill sheets, this is very important. I put this there on the very top part because it is utmost important. All of these will be tested on. You will be tested on every single one of these. Now, granted, I don't expect you to know how to do that tonight. But it would be nice for y'all at some point in time to print all these off and start reading over them. They're not going to mean anything to you right now unless you've been through here before. Um, I hope we have a lot of first responders in here. Maybe some of y'all have some background knowledge. And please tell me some new cool stuff. I haven't worked on NAMLETS, unfortunately, in a hot minute, but I, I am a clinician and I stay on top of my things uh, due to the oil field. So print these out. These will be your EMT Bible while you're in this class. Uh, please, I apologize if I did some offense there, uh, referencing it, but you need to know these. These will be something that will, you need to live by these. If you believe in osmosis, print them out, put them on your cupella, start sleeping on them. This right here will get you checked off into ready to take your registry. You have to pass all of these without any critical failures to go on to registry. So prime example, let's look at one. Um, our chapter tonight is really not that long, so I'm trying to give you all a lot of information. So here's how we're gonna do bleeding control and shock management. So we need to get a total of seven points to pass the bleeding control and shock management. But what you do not need to do is make any of these critical failure criteria. Because if, if you put one where you uh, mistakenly did not notify uh, appropriately verbalized saying that you forgot your PPE, which is personal protective equipment, you, you fail that module. You're done. Thank you. Come again. There is no retry. Go back to, you know, re go back to go and collect $200. There's no, no. You will fail. We will tell you this. Thank you for your attempts. Please exit the room. It sucks. I've, I've had that happen to me. I had to take well, my paramedics. I was the last one in Mississippi to take the handwritten National Registry. I'm going to date myself there. So that being the case, my skills were a lot more than this as a paramedic. But these are something simple. If you fail and if you click any, if you make one of those mistakes, you have to go back over and pay to take this module or take that over. So this is just some of the things that we want y'all to get used to. Um, I don't know why that is in my way. Um, I can't get rid of it now because my, there it is, won't get out of the way. My controls class won't allow me to move the screen, so we have to give it a second for it to go away so I can. Just won't move it. Stand by. This is comical here. Oh. Found it. All right. So I'm going to go back to here and bring y'all back up. So y'all can see we're going to close that. Get back into our J learning. This have any questions on this particular? I'm saying speak now or forever hold you. It, it is pretty confusing. I'm going to. Uh, Send myself a lot of Discord messages. A lot. Let's just.
Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Delayed response in getting my email. I will answer you, but please give me time to give get to you. If for some odd reason I tell you guys that I'm out of pocket, uh, Rob already knows that. He will be well aware, and he can opt in and take uh, while I may be out of pocket. Um, so, I, oh, geez, I got to catch up on all these questions real quick. Uh, yeah, I know. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, let's see. All right. So I think I've got up to all the questions. Um, so if nobody has any questions there, um, that is overall that. Um, I don't know how to really show my screen for the dream because I, I mean, the Discord, I don't think I have it on my computer. I know I have it on my iPad over here. Um, but I don't know how to share that screen. I'm still learning. I'm a, I'm a Mac guy, so I'm still learning all that part. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'm actually going to mess with Rob and let him explain some of Discord to you guys on how we use it, why we use it, um, and some benefits of that. Um, and then I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I want to fix for me nuts on my screen. Um, but Rob, do you have any questions or any insight that you can add for them on um, Discord? Yeah, so we use Discord for pretty much everything Aries. In the past, we had um, basically a different communication platform for everything we did, and it got really out of hand. So we put everything in the Discord, um, which is both good and bad. A lot of y'all that just got in tonight, you kind of saw that where you started asking questions or started conversations in a room that was not really your EMT room, which is fine. Um, but, you know, I try to kind of corral everybody and y'all have your own room. And there's a couple of things that you've got access to. You have the regular chat room that, it's loud, sorry. You got a regular chat room that you can actually text in, talk in, stuff like that. We also have voice channels um, so that you can actually talk, talk to each other. We are working on putting in some um, tutoring channels so that if anybody has an issue with something you're just not quite getting in like airway chapter for example everybody struggles with airway uh cardiology cardiology we can work with you on that um we do have other students we have people that are alumni of the class that have gone through the class and they're in those general chat chat rooms are not actually in your emt class so if you've got a question if something's not making sense maybe chris wally is explaining something in a way that's not quite quite clicking um, you can always put the question in there. I'm in there. Justin Miller's in there. All these different instructors are there that can try try to explain it a little bit different way. So you've got that. You've got that community. You've got it with the people that are in this class. You've also got it with people who have gone through the classes in the past. So questions about registry to an extent. I mean, they can't tell you answers and, and questions you're going to see. But if you want to know what the registry is like, if you've got questions about how it flows and things like that, you know, we've got people who just went through it and can give you a lot of insight. Um, it just, we think that it's, it's something that will help benefit y'all. And to kind of keep this going, if as the class goes on, we this class finishes and next class comes up, we hope that y'all will stick around because then you can be a source of knowledge for the people in the classes coming after you. Uh, if you have any questions on Discord, there is, there's, there's a lot of things you can do with it that we really just don't do. So if you've got questions about something, you can ask. But um, you know, if you start getting into things like slash commands and everything, you're going to get over my head real quick, and there's not a lot I can answer for you. But just to kind of stay in touch with everybody, that's a really good platform, and that's where we're going to pretty much hang out. Texting and emails. Um, texting is not an official communication platform for us. Emails can be if it needs to be something private, but if it's something that we can address as a group, we'll do it in Discord. So I don't know, Chris, are you still there? Or do you want to put him on a break or what you got? Uh, uh, let's do that. Hey, tell you what, y'all take about, uh, let's do 10 minutes. I'm trying to fix something on my end so I can get everything situated. And then once we get back, we'll jump right into the lecture. All right. So y'all take, a, we'll see y'all back at 650 by my watch.
Does anybody that's here or anything that's going on, does anybody have any questions or anything for me before we get kicked off tonight? Yes, I have a question. Please talk to me. Um, I just have a question. Why is it we got to take the HESI test and take the National Registry? Because that is what we uh, are moving more towards. Um, the HESI is going to better prepare you for National Registry. Um, and it, it will help you get a better pass ratio versus the registry. That makes sense. Something to, something yes, to keep in are. mind. So, like I said, the HESI, is not, the HESI is not required to pass the class. You're going to take your final exam and get your final grade and your certificate. What we use the HESI for is to prepare you for the registry because the registry, I'm not going to mince words, it is okay. difficult. It's, it's, it's extremely hard. The way the registry works, and it has since 2006 or so, they're going to give you a question and it's going to be difficult. If you get it right, your next one's harder. If you get that one right, your next one's harder and harder until you miss one. A lot of people get into the registry and they wind up, they wind up not passing. And a lot of times it's because they, the, the tests that you take in class don't really quite prepare you for the way the registry is and people get caught off guard. So the HESI is a very good way of kind of getting you ready for the registry. And if you're going to struggle in a test, I'd rather you struggle in the HESI because it's a lot cheaper uh, and there's no, there's no real limit to how many times you can take it. Whereas they're going to cut you off if you um, fail the registry too many times. So my goal is to get it to where you got the best chance of passing it one time and being done with it, which is why we, this is the first class we've done it with. We, this is, you know, putting the HESI in there. Um, it's, it's not, some people use it like a, you have to pass this test so you fail the class. That's not what we're doing. We're using it more for what it's meant for, which is to kind of prep you for the actual registry test, the one that matters to get you patched. Okay. Um, and two things I, I want to add to this. Um, for the ones that use Discord and that are going to download it however you wish you way, please do me a favor. And uh, my memory is uh, I'm full of vast knowledge, as some people are laughing in the background. But please do me a favor. Just put your name that you're registered with the class. Because when I look at, uh, I think the last one I had was like, I forgot the guy's name. His name was Mike, but he went by uh, Little Jim, and I was like, I, "Who? Who's this? I, I don't, I don't know you." So please, that, please help me out because every time, unless you're tired of hearing, be like, "Hey, I don't, I don't know who you are." If you don't want to hear that every single time, please help me out and put your uh, the name that you're gonna <laughs> register the class for and how you want your certificate written uh, in Discord. That would just help me out. Um, so let's dive into, um, the lecture. Let me, um, and let's do this. Or not. All right, hang on. Whew. All right, so we're going to talk about EMS systems tonight, all right? I have to get some things adjusted on my screen. So when I change screens back and forth, everything just does not get in the right position. So it takes me a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm slow. I'm, I'm, I'm special and slow. So y'all have to bear with me. Y'all will learn deeply. Um, all right, so... There's a lot of things when we start these slides that I have to read and I have to go over. It drives me insane to do it, but that is just some things that National Registry does require. It's part of the standards. It's just stuff we have to do. And you will be able to tell by my tone later on we go. It's like, all right, education, standard and competencies. So this applies to fundamental knowledge of emergency medical services, the system safety, well-being, of the EMT, the medical, legal, and ethical issues to, the, to the provision of emergency care. So we're gonna talk about in the EMS systems, we're gonna have EMS system, history of EMS, roles, responsibilities, professionalism of EMS personnel, quality improvement, 
and patient safety. So I don't know how many of you guys are fire-based, hospital-based. I hope to learn that. Um, I know that some of you are not hospital or fire-based. I, I get that. But some of these, well, you'll hear me say QI, QA, which is quality improvement or quality assessment. Um, I will try my best to make sure if I use an acronym, I say it first, like EMS systems. Now we know that's emergency medical services. So it's EMS systems. So if we go later on and I just say QI, that, that is what we're saying is quality improvement. Um, as we're going through here, please don't hesitate and unmuting yourselves because I think I have muted everybody uh, to where you guys can, um, let me make sure I have muted everybody, to where you guys can um, ask a question. Uh, so that way you can unmute yourselves. It's not a all the time mute, well, it is now, but until, unless you unmute yourself. Um, uh, I see some somebody's lower asked a, a question, or is that just, you're trying to figure out what buttons do? Because trust me, I, I do it too. No, I was just All right. showing people if you could raise your hand to ask a question. If Please, you yes. And that helps me, and I didn't know this until I, I can lower your hand, ha, didn't know that. I was like, oh, God, did he, what did he see? And I didn't know. So I didn't mean to just knock you off. But yes, if y'all have questions, please feel free. You can click on it, raise your hand. You can do whatever you want. It just, or just unmute your mic and talk to me. I'm cool with either way. It's not going to hurt my feelings for y'all to be like, what? What? See, he's talking too fast. Tell me, slow down, back over something if you guys are taking notes. All it's right. okay if I, um, if I turn my camera off and nurse my baby. <laughs> Baby, please. Family's way more important than me. I promise you. I'm, I'm here. Right. I'm listening. Right. I'm right here. I am still all about you being a mama, girl. You take care of that little one. All right. I'm Andrea, all right. Andrea, by chance, are you from New Orleans? Yes, I am. I love your accent. I love it. I'm, I'm yes. here for all of it. <laughs> He's not from around South, I can tell you that. All right, so we're going to talk about wait, that. Wait, so, wait, 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 Chris. Don't get it twisted. I'm from Memphis, born and raised. Oh, what's born the, and raised. the big, the big Memphis. You got the med. You got some good places in the Memphis now. BB King, yes. Bill Street. I love it. Also, hey, wait, wait. You forgot to mention the Memphis Tigers. So we just don't. Oh, well, leave see, it that's there. where we forgot because Ole Miss is way better. It's okay. I'm just saying Memphis Tigers. It's okay. It's okay. All right. Well, listen, I hope, I hope. I bunch to get in, in touch with you guys. I hope to learn you guys from where your regions. So, and I'm all about you picking on me versus I will I will call y'all out and be like, oh, okay, well, nobody's got any questions. Let me call on whomever and I'll just click a name. Um, so moving on from there. Ah, see, you got my mind off everything. So we're gonna talk about research, what research is gathered, how why they do certain things, um, and what is the basically the impact and why are they studying um, delay of treatment or downtimes in the ERs because of overfilled ERs versus what is that doing to uh, keep EMS from being out on the streets? That's a big study right now. Uh, where does this data go? Like, just because I fill in these little bubbles off these reports, why do I need them? Or after I talk to my insurance company, why do they care about hearing how, I, how the call went? Well, that helps them get better. Um, also, as a side note, guys, my, my wife works in an insurance company, so there are some times that I refer to things because I, I very little tidbit know of what she does. So that's the reason why I, when I gather information, when I do work the truck, it's because I know it saves the, the call takers down the road times. So I will harp on things like that. And then we talk about evidence-based decision and why we make those decisions. I would talk about public health, use simple knowledge of principles of illnesses and injury prevention for emergency care. Here's our introduction. Um, yeah, there you go. That's really what we're going to talk about. I, I, um, so this is very important. Let me talk about this. So you will learn the difference between first aid training, which um, everybody's going to have CPR, first aid. And then you will talk about Department of Transportation. So national DOT, not just because we're talking about Tennessee Department of Transportation or I forgot what Louisiana is called, but it's the Louisiana Department of Transit, or MDOT, which is for Mississippi. Please don't hold it against me. I am from Mississippi. Um, I will pick on the state very much about myself because I'm from here. But DOT does govern, and they push down 
they push to the side a lot of rules and regulations for EMS. Um, and that's the national side. Some states vary in different things. Like a uh, prime example, does everybody know who Acadian Ambulance Service is in South Louisiana? They're really big and they're also in Memphis. Uh, I know they're all over Louisiana, but their main colors are, uh, their ambulances are white and green. Well, in the state of Mississippi, your ambulances must be white and orange. Doesn't really matter what color your logo is. That is something that they've never changed. Uh, I've seen in other states that they can be any color they want. They just have to have a certain logo size, reflectiveness. Uh, they can run red and blue lights. In the state of Mississippi, there has to be a certain type of marking on the ambulance. They can only run red lights. Uh, with white uh, alternating devices. Uh, it's, it's really weird what our DOT has pushed to our EMS leg, uh, legislation has made uh, EMS agencies in Mississippi do. Um, then we're going to talk about the different levels of EMT versus AEMT, uh, paramedic, EMR, all these different things. We're going to discuss those. Um, and that is basically our key components of the EMS system. So uh, the EMS systems is consists of a team of healthcare professionals. Everybody in this, can you see my cursor moving on y'all's screen? Or is that, oh, never mind. Don't worry about that. Um, so this consists of a team of professionals. Doesn't matter if it's the EMS team that pulls up, the fire department, the police department, the ambulance, everybody is part of a team. Everybody has different jobs to do on that scene. The fire department may be a full uh, ALS, and when I say it's advanced life support, they may be a full ALS team where they have paramedics, um, critical care, but they still are tasked with doing extrication on a site. Um, the police department makes, uh, makes sure that the scene is safe. They take care of things. Um, the EMS agency, Yes, they may be secondary on scenes besides the fire department, but due to laws, that transporting paramedic is ultimately responsible. Don't matter if you get out of paramedic school and you graduate tomorrow and you pass registry, you still trump me on a scene, but if I'm with the fire department base, because you're a transporting paramedic. It's kind of weird, but that's how it goes. And um is governed by state laws, which we know that. And I just talked about that, how the state laws are governed, um, different things that they talk about and why we talk about it. Um, is the screen showing different on y'all's screen? Is it showing because of my main screen over here? It's just frozen. Can somebody tell me? So it's saying you're on slide two out of eight. When you share your screen, you're not going to be able to like fully see what you're actually doing. You'll just be able to know that you're sharing exactly what you're supposed to be sharing after you click the square to, you know, pick the screen you're on. You see what I'm saying? See, where are you when I'm trying to do this instructor education? Man, because on saying, mine, it shows I'm on seven of 85. So maybe you might have to stop sharing and then reshare because your screen is not syncing. So if you see us, your screen is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Not only that, now you you see seven, seven of 85 is your overall slide. The two of eight is just that section. So if your slide says at the top, two of eight in parentheses, and then you're on the same slide. Yeah, that's that's not the screen we want to see. But That's not what right I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Hang You're on. on the. We were on the right slide. You, you were showing slide two of eight before. So how this are you? This is the technical before, difficulties right? that I talk about that will continue on throughout this program, and it is not. No, no, no. It, it's not only but Chris Wally's issues. No, it's just Chris Wally don't understand how to work it. It's okay. So <laughs> yeah, just, see, that's exactly how we're gonna start because he is correct. I'm, I'm pretty sure I just heard I'm, okay boom somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. You've been disconnected. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's see here what. All right, now let's try this. All right, so after you successfully complete the course, uh, you should be able to take the National Registry exam or some states require state certifications. 
Um, after you pass the certification exam, you are eligible to apply for state licensure. Like uh, Mississippi, we require you to pass your program, uh, pass the final on the program. Then you get your national registry card once you do there. And then all you have to do is go into the state of Mississippi, fill out an application, and you pay your money. Imagine that. You got to pay the state money to be an EMT. Then you'll get your certificate to be a state EMT. All right. Most states, you'll have EMRs, uh, EMT. So this is the level of training that we go. So technically, number one should be uh, EMT. I mean, uh, first responders, CPR certified. Those are the things. So EMR stands for emergency medical responder. Uh, your EMT is an emergency medical technician. That's the class that you get to visit with me for the next semester. AEMT is advanced EMT. And the paramedic is the final stage. Now, not necessarily the final stage, but in for EMS. There are a lot of nurse or in paramedics uh, in the EMS world. Uh, you have your nurse paramedics that fly. Some of them are on critical care trucks. Uh, there's a different variety of, of services that different agencies provide. But that's just the levels that we're going to talk about. All right, here is, so the EMR is your very basic training. It provides uh, care before the ambulance gets there. Most cases, these are like your county fire department, some small town rule. Um, rule really messes me, so I'm sorry. When I say that word, sometimes I have to think about it. Like brewery, it really throws me off. Um, these may assist in ambulances. A lot of times these EMRs are not necessarily nationally registered, but there is a spot where they can become nationally registered. Um, some of your police departments uh, do um, have EMRs. They do have EMTs and on up. Um, they have different levels. Um, it, it's great to see how agencies are now paying for that, to have that ability to, for, their for, their, for their service to offer different levels of support. Um, so the EMT has a uh, basic life support. This is, talks about the AEDs, the Automated External Defibrillator. They have airway adjuncts, and they can assist the patients with certain medications. Now, we'll go into what medications you can assist at a later time. So that's not like you're like, oh, what, I get to give medicine? No, not really. You get to assist, but that we'll, we'll go over that. Click. All right. So as an uh, advanced EMT, has training uh, very specific in certain aspects of uh, ALS, which is advanced life support. They can do IVs. Uh, they can start any uh, peripheral IV um, once you start about different types of IVs, but those are uh, administering a limited number of emergency medicines. Depending upon that, um, Ms. Donna talked about into our Discord, so she's our clinical educator, which we'll be coming to talk to y'all at some point. So you have the ability as an AEMT to give some uh, medications. Um, I know that's broke down later in the chapter. I just don't want to confuse you guys as we start to talk about things. So then we talk about paramedics. So a paramedic has an extensive ALS training that do include, not limited to, <laughs> the endotracheal intubation, which means I can stick a tube down your throat and breathe for you. It's like putting tube yeah, about yeah, baby, down your throat. Uh, different sizes, uh, we can choose that. You have your emergency pharmacology. We're supposed to know um, body weight. Uh, we can guesstimate or we have certain types. A little Braslow tape that we can lay out for pediatric and kind of break it down for us. Um, and how to convert from pounds to kilograms and uh, certain, message, certain medications are given by, by weight of kilogram. You have your cardiac monitor, which we can do three leads or four leads and 12 leads. And um, then you have a lot of other uh, assessments and treatments that we're allowed to do. Some paramedics in different parts of the country can do a lot more than versus what we can uh, in Mississippi. And then I can do a lot more versus what they can do maybe uh, in the East Coast or West Texas, because different levels of training, different doctors allow us to do different things uh, if we're working underneath them. Uh, All right, Rob just says he's out. He's got to take care of some things. Um, so that's that. Um, so the EMT course includes four learning activities. Sometimes I can tell you there's some questions that you may want to pay attention to. So you kind of hear me, I'll knock or kind of bling my eyes and say <clears throat> several times. 
But so different types of uh, learning activities, you may go through reading assignments, obviously is what we're talking about here, uh, lectures, and I try not to be boring, but some of these lectures are just as wonderful as they can come across for me as you too. Um, step by step demonstrations. And so our demonstrations we'll talk about in some of our lectures as we go over things. But we have boot camps and y'all have kind of been wondering like what are these boot camps like I well, what we do is we talk about it and we kind of modulate a lot of the things that we need you to learn. And then you go to it's like a skill station. Uh, you go to these boot camps and you're able to do your skills, you do your checkoffs, you do all these different things at these boot camps. And then you have your summary skill sheets, which I showed y'all on JB Learning. Um, that's some of the things that you're going to need to learn. And then you have case presentations and scenarios. What uh, I, I can think of millions of cases that I could print present to you guys because I've ran through them and what type of different scenarios um, I, I encourage when we do that I encourage everybody type it in there if you don't want to turn on your you know your thing and talk your camera and talk uh, I encourage you to just let everybody uh, know uh, we have some of these uh, hot topics that I'll encourage everyone if you'll see it pop up on your uh, calendar side for JB learning to just participate and just learn from everybody maybe there's something that some people can do uh, in the Midwest versus in the North, uh, like New York, they have an ungodly amount of protocols, but we may not be able to do that down South. Uh, just some things that it's the educational part. So participate with that. So the EMTs are the backbones of EMS. We rely on EMTs. We, every good paramedic has a great EMT behind them. And, and I don't mean that as in like, oh, they stand behind you. No, I, I can't do it by myself. I have to have a support. Um, the service that I work for at home, uh, it's the EMT paramedic. We don't run double paramedics. Um, it cost efficiently is not cost efficiency. is not there for uh, a lot of your services to do that. So a lot of times you just get dual, uh, uh, an EMT and a paramedic on an ambulance. Some more rural uh, services only do EMTs or an advanced EMT. So it, it just depends on where you're at is what these uh, EMTs are and, and what services are provided. Uh, let's see, they provide emergency care to the sick and injured, which is obviously that's what most of your ambulances do. They are a sick Uber. Uh, that's just the easiest way to put it. Uh, you get your sick Uber and they say, take me to the hospital. Well, you realize you just have a ingrown toenail, but you're fisting to walk up, all right. Let's go to the hospital. We'll sit on the stretcher for the next eight hours. It, it's okay with me because I get paid by the hour, not by the call. So that's, that's what our EMTs do these days. And y'all are going to learn more and more we go throughout here um, on how things are going to work. Uh, same thing with the fire departments. They, they do the same thing. They go to these calls and there's like, it's two o'clock in the morning. You've had, now I've had trouble breathing for the last eight hours, but you decide to call at two o'clock in the morning. I am happy with that. I'm glad to spend my two o'clock in the morning hour time with you. So that's, sorry, that's my little side rant, but that's the truth. All right, so licensures. So this is a requirement. We all have to have licensures. It's not like our driving license um, to operate an ambulance. You do have to have a, uh, an, EM, uh, an ambulance license. Um, you have to have a driver's operating course and all that stuff. And most of the time your EMS agencies teach that themselves. Um, so the requirements of this uh, from, some states require different things, but generally it's required to be licensed or employed as an EMT. Um, some services will employ you as just as a driver only. Um, and that's maybe because you're currently are in EMT school and you need a job and they need uh, a warm body on a truck. That's kind of where we are these days. And since you're going to school, they're going to employ you to just be a driver which it's kind of benefiting both of you because you're like, hey, I'm getting a check, going to school and I get to drive an ambulance with license art, it's cool. So nowadays, here we go, proof of, proof of immunizations against certain communicable diseases. I, I love a good debate, um, maybe not time for class tonight, but on what communicable diseases and what immunizations were required. Um, but 99% of your ambulances uh, hospitals require you to have all your vaccines, vaccines, huh, and your vaccination for COVID. So if you have it, 
that's completely 110% your personal belief and I support you. If you have, that is completely 100% your support and your belief and I support you both ways. Doesn't bother, it doesn't bother me a bit. But um, I will tell you, for your EMS services to receive Medicaid, Medicare reimbursements, which 90% of your ambulances live off of those reimbursements. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, so if I transport my father, he's on Medicare, he's of age, he's actually got both. That, okay, so he has Medicare. My wife's and she's telling me what I really need to say. They will pay a certain amount of expense. So I'm just going to use it's $100 to go to the hospital, which we all know that's not true. They will pay up to, let's say, $80 of it. And then the other party is the other either third party insurance or is responsible for that part. But to receive that reimbursement, the federal government has required them to prove that 99 of 99 percent of their services are been have been vaccinated. So the company that I work for, they want to receive their money too. And I don't blame them. So they required everybody to receive uh, their vaccine, vaccination. I work on an offshore oil rig. I'm the only medical provider out there. I am your psychiatrist. I'm your pharmacist. I'm your doctor. I'm your pharmacist. I, I'm at all. I mean, I had to get it. So it was a hard decision. It was a personal decision, but I support that. But knowing that, that you're going to have to do your ambulance rides, understand that a service may require you to get that and show proof. Successful completion and background check and drug screening and a valid driver's license. Every agency is going to do a background check. They're going to make you pee in a cup and say, thank you so much. We'll call you in seven to 10 days. And if you don't have a good license, you're not driving an ambulance. I don't really care. So you're going to have a valid driver's license. Um, no, obviously, felonies either, because Master Rescue would not allow you to be a felon and carry a paramedic or EMT license. So you also have to successfully complete a uh, CPR class, which we will teach that throughout here. And when you go through one of your boot camps, you will get checked off and all that. And you'll get one of my wonderful signatures on a CPR card. You have to successfully complete a EMT course, a state-approved EMT course. And you have to also complete a state-recognized uh, Certification, sorry, again, I'm trying to get my glasses to zoom in right here. And then you also have to do a state recognized practical, cert uh, practical certification exam. So at the end of the class, not only will you have to take a final, but you will have to do a skills check off. What that does then, every one of those skill sheets that I showed you, you will have to do them with 100% completion and pass the class. So once you do your skills check off, you'll get a signature from your instructor that does that uh, at the boot camp wherever you are located in the country. And those forms will come to me and then I will sign off on them, Rob will get them and he'll sign them off on them as the uh, owner of the company. And then that gets submitted into the National Registry. Same thing is when you complete your final, I will sign off on it, uh, Rob will sign off on it and that goes in the National Registry. Once all that's done, I'll be like, hey, congratulations. Let me know how you did on your test. We're good from there. And then you had to demonstrate the mental and physical abilities necessary to safely, properly perform all the tasks fundamentals deserve described as the role of an EMT. Are you competent enough to pass the test, pass the hands-on, and put on your uniform and look professional? That's really what agencies care for nowadays is what I need you to do. And then I need you to be compliant with state, local, and other employment provisions. means that you can hold a job in the U.S. and not be an illegal alien. That's really what it breaks that down to be. All right, so the ADA, uh, if anybody knows, is familiar with that. That's the Americans with Disabilities Act in 19, of 1990. Uh, this protects people who have disabilities from being denied access to programs and services that are provided by state or local governments. It prohibits employers from falling to, failing to provide full and equal employment to the disabled, uh, Title I protects EMTs with disabilities who are seeking gainfully employment under many circumstances. Employers with a certain number of employees are required to adjust pro processes so that the candidate with the disability can be considered for a position and modify the work environment or how the job is done normally. I worked with a very, very 
great individual uh, that had dual prosthetics on his on his legs. For the longest time, I thought he had knee braces because he'd always talk about having surgery. But I just assume that's just not one of those you ask. Until one day, we're in the stairwell of a pretty big business here in uh, in the local area, and I hear, and I didn't really pay attention. He said, "Hey, Wally, here, hold my leg." And I was like, "What? What'd you just say to me?" Yeah, that was a shock. I was not prepared for that. Neither was the lady that was the, that we were there to take care of, because she was like, "Oh, baby." I'll get up and get on the stretcher. It's okay. You don't have to take your legs off. So again, it's not just saying that you, just because you have a disability doesn't mean that you can't do the job. Not only did this guy, have excellent paramedic, he uh, later became a excellent flight paramedic. And now he's a wonderful instructor out in Colorado. He's on the USA disability uh, volleyball team. Phenomenal guy. I've, I've had several classes underneath him. And then it says professional background is in accordance with the state and criminal uh, requirements. Uh, it depends on what state you're from on what type of background they require. Um, overview of a, uh, EMS systems. As the history of EMS, what are the origins of EMS include? Volunteer ambulances of World War I, field care in World War II, field medic and rapid helicopter evacuation from the Korean conflict. All of those interest me a lot. And the reason why they interest me a lot is because of, uh, it's just, that's, that's part of our uh, involvement of EMS um, on how things started. Where did we come from? Why did EMS evolve? So if you have time and you want to, you know, do some information, just read up on that. That's really cool. Um, here's a little breakdown of it. Uh, it says, as, a recent, as recently as 1960s and early 70s, uh, ambulance services and care uh, widely or varied widely in the U.S. means some areas didn't have it. Some areas may have just a hearse that rode around and threw in the back of the ambulance or threw back of the hearse, took you to the hospital. If you didn't make it, they just continue on to the uh, funeral home and you became one of theirs. Um, EMS, as we know it today, originated in 1966 with the uh, publication of the Accidental Death and Disabilities. Uh, the neglected disease of modern science is more commonly known as the white paper. Uh, Emergency Services Act of 1973 created a funding source and programs to develop improved systems of free hospital care. And then uh, the DOT published its first EMT training curriculum in the 1970s. That would probably know that, um, specifically 1971. Um, I can guarantee you will see that on a National Registry test question. Um, is when did the DOT uh, publish its first EMT training curriculum? I'll knock on that one. And then the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons prepared to publish the first EMT textbook in 1971. Again, we go back to some of the old ones of like uh, Rampart, y'all remember Squad 51. From some of you younger ones, if you hadn't, just YouTube Squad 51. It's an old TV show out of LA. I actually got to meet uh, both of those stars, they're both the first paramedics ever involved. Those were, uh, they came and spoke really cool dudes or something that I have pictures of and some autographs. That was pretty neat. All right. So efforts are underway to standardize the level of EMS education nationally. In the late 1970s, the DOT developed and recommended national standard curriculum. During the 1980s, many areas enhanced the EMT national standard curriculum by adding EMTs uh, with advanced levels of training who could provide key components of AOS uh, and new advanced life-saving things because we want to get them better. We want to improve. We want to make things better. If you look to the state of Florida, every state-funded vehicle has to have a AED on it, which is really cool, all the way from uh, the meter maid to the Local, all the cop cars have it, and even garbage trucks that are fed, that are state funded, all have to have AEDs in them. That's why the life expectancy in Florida is so high, and people just they die and they bring them back. Keep they got to keep that taxpayer money coming in. That's probably cold harder there, but that's kind of the way I look at it. In 1990, NHTSA National Highway Traffic Standard Act revised the EMS agenda for the future and published the EMS agenda for 2050. This funny thing is, is now seeing what that in the 2019 versus what the 2050 says versus what we have now in 2022 of what the new EMS futures come in. Those are pretty neat for me to kind of to look at and see what's changed. So we talk about levels of training. 
uh, federal levels. The National EMS Scope of Practice a model provides guidance for the EMS skill. This document provides overarching uh, guidelines for minimum skills each level of the EMS provider should be able to perform. So you have your state level uh, laws regulated by EMS provider and operations. So I'm sure everybody on here is familiar with like AMR, Amer American Medical Re uh, Response. That is a big ambulance service across the country. Uh, some of you may be used to uh, like Memphis fire transports. You have Acadian ambulance. I don't know where everybody's from. You have Pafford. It's in Mississippi and Louisiana. You have AAA. I, I don't know some of the other services and where you all guys are at yet, but you have all these different services that have uh, state areas. Uh, then you have the local level. So the medical director provides daily oversight and support of EMS. Um, yes, so uh, New Orleans EMS, uh, that's a really, and that's a wonderful down there. Um, so let's talk about, what, so the medical director. So I'm going to use Chris Wiley's ambulance service. Just because I have the funding, I may not have the money, but I know somebody can help me fund it. We're going to create this business. We're going to go with Wally's ambulance service. Okay, so I started getting all the equipment. Well, I got to have a doctor because I even got to have a prescription to order uh, oxygen. All right, so now I got to find a doctor that's willing to allow us to operate underneath his medical licensure as EMTs and paramedics. So let's say I hire 500 people and I'm getting big. Each one of those providers represents this doctor. So not only do we say, hey, make sure you do good for you and for the company, but remember, if you mess up bad enough, you'll never have another license again because that doctor is now saying, you ain't operating underneath my license because you done didn't screw me over. I ain't gonna let you mess with Fred's license either. Because So those things get very particular. So for every ambulance we have out there, there's a medical doctor that that company pays to kind of be the medical overview of them. So at that point is, there's we always have to operate underneath the doctor's license. So here, as you see the figure on the side, it, it illustrates the uh, heracles of the national scope of EMS practices. So you have your modern day, uh, modern medical directions, which is day to day, your state EMS offices, and this is EMS administration, regulatory role, legis legislation, liaison role, and then your national EMS scope of practical models as theoretically found. So all of these intertwine in some form or fashion. That's like, um, say Texas and Florida right now, those are not nationally registered states, which means you can take the state test uh, and pass and operate. But if you move from Texas or Florida and you say you go to North Carolina, well, you can't just go get on an ambulance because now you have to take nationally registry over and you may have been out 10 years. You're like, huh, you, you want me to take what? So we highly, highly encourage anybody that to where if you once you take this, just say you you move to a state that doesn't take national registry, keep your national registry up because I can tell you, I will never take that class over at that test ever again. I can end up being a quadriplegic and I'm gonna attend my refresher courses. I ain't losing my license. I'm not retaking that national registry. That was one of the hardest tests I've ever taken in my life at the paramedic level. Not doing it. I'm just telling y'all from experience. All right. So we talk about public BLS and immediate aid. So you have millions of people out there that are lay BLS responders, um, but at the same time, as they're not obligated to come and help. Um, we we are not obligated either, but it's in our blood. That's why you're here is because something about this class interests you, and you're like, I want to do that. Okay may I ask the same question is, but why? Uh, I've been doing it for so long now. It's just, that's the only thing that I, I know that I love. Like I truly love doing what I do. So you have these lay personnel also, and they're able to use these AEDs. Like I was in a, a store down in, and I, my sister lives in South Louisiana and I, I go stay with her before I go offshore. And there was a store down there that had an AED mounted on the wall, which I remember when AEDs came out and they were about $10,000 a piece, just the small little AED thing. 
now you can buy an AD, I want to say for like 1500 bucks uh, and put off uh, on a shelf. And some businesses do that because it helps lower their insurance because they provide a service and keep their people trained that allows them to have this. So it's, it's kind of cool to see that, but you're like, huh, I'm wondering who in here is a first responder. Well, that being the case is, is you don't like in Mississippi, I don't have to stop at a wreck because I see it happen. But if I pass by the wreck and somebody is like, oh, I know Wally, he's a paramedic. They can come after you. But at the same time is I don't have nothing on my vehicle that says I'm a paramedic or a responder. I ain't have an EMS tag. Now, that's just me because I value my off time. I, I encourage everybody to be a first responder and to be a volunteer because this country, we need that. We need our first responders and our volunteers to come back into service because they're just disappearing. So if you ever have that opportunity, please volunteer with your local fire department. That's my little tidbit. Nobody pays me for that, but I was going to give you all some information. All right, so uh, EMRs, what did these partake? We, we talked about it earlier. You have your local law enforcement. Some firefighters are EMRs. Uh, they have just the basic training, which is, hey, it's a start. Um, every federal park ranger is required to be at a minimum of an EMR. Um, some uh, ski patrols out in Colorado and uh, the Utahs and all that, they have all these parks. A lot of them now do require them to be paramedics and remote. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain, it's just like, it's a remote training, a remote care. It's, it's, it's a really extensive course. Um, but EMR training provides these individuals with the skills necessary to initiate immediate care. So it allows them to start. Let's say they're going to start care because the ambulance is now, they 40 minutes out. Well, we got to do something. So these, these companies have paid for them to come out and be providers, and, and they help them stay on top of their, their training. They send them, uh, matter, okay, so matter of fact, to so the old rig that I'm on, they have to have five EMRs on board at every single time, even though I'm there. And that company pays for it. If there's a certain particular class that I want to go to, I can put into the company I'm assigned to, and they'll pay for it. Uh, and they'll also send our EMRs, or they'll pay for me to go be an instructor and bring it back and teach the EMRs on board. So these companies just see the benefit into that. So not only do these companies, or these other companies are like, oh, I can teach that. I don't mind being an instructor sometimes, but I like being I like being a student. To me, it's valuable on learning both. I like to learn from you guys. I like to learn from another instructor. So I'm open to it all. And I, I do enjoy teaching and, and doing education has, has been a good big part of me. So I, I get it. Uh, this is part of me, who I am now in the EMS world. So as you see here, the EMT course requires about 150 to 200 hours. Now that is not saying that is, that's it. Uh, it could be somewhere between the 185. I, I, I can't tell you how many hours y'all get to stare at this ugly face, but we're going to have a good time at it. But the EMT possesses a knowledge and skills to provide basic emergency care. I'm going to give you the basics. I'm just going to give you A, B, C, D, E, and F. I, I, I hope that all y'all get out there and you're like, man, I really want to do more. Oh, please do more. You may not have to do it through ARIES because we offer uh, the AEMT. We're supposed to do our paramedic course, but go get more education. You can get more education even as the EMT and continue on your, your education part. So the EMT, together with the role of the EMTs who have responded, assumes responsibility of the assessment, the care, the packaging of a patient, and getting that patient to the higher level of care. When they talk about EMT's response and they have a a paramedic uh, sprint, like they say, they put me in a pickup truck and I drive to your scene and then I get in the truck and take over. Yes, I'm a higher level of care, but at the same time is the highest level of care that needs to be sent and given to, that is the emergency room. We need to get people faster to the ERs, faster to the ORs. So not saying, oh, we just need to throw them in the truck and burn some diesel. No, no. There's things that we can do in the field that can stabilize them. We control the bleeding. We can uh, give these patients certain type of medications and be on our way. So obviously not as an EMT, but you, you can't do the IV therapy. You can do some basic uh, airway adjuncts. We'll talk about that as we go through there. And I'll talk about the basics. 
and then I'll tell you some of the advanced ones. And if I'm all sore during that chapter, I'll show you some of those. Um, I don't really have a whole lot here in my house. My wife limits me on the toys that I can keep here for school. So I keep all the cool stuff offshore. And then we have a, uh, administering of limits the number of medications. So we talk about our AEMTs can do those medications, but we want to make sure that you, you know the difference. So that's the reason why I like, I really got bored as an EMT and that's what made me want to go be a paramedic. I wanted to do more for every call that I went out there to. So that's, that was that was my driving. I hope that you have a different drive, to, you know, do a better drive. If you're like, no, I really want to go to nursing, please do it. Don't stop. Continue your education uh, and use every bit of it that you can do. Um, so paramedics, as you can see here, uh, they started the IV on this guy. Um, it really looks like they've missed it because you can see a little bit of blood there, but they're already retracting the needle. I like to make fun of that, but that's okay. We all miss IVs. So we have uh, the extended co extensive course training. I can specifically remember when I went to paramedic school <clears throat> 20 years ago that I had 1,800 hours. That was what my requirement was. I was a two-year program. I was the last two-year program, and that was a long two years, let me tell you. So we had to do, classroom was the majority of the time. We had to do internship, where we had to do so many hours in the hospital, OR, uh, OB receiving, OB delivery. We had to do uh, so many uh, intubations. We had to do all of that. And I had about 1,800 hours in that course. Uh, they may be offered within this, uh, its contents of an associate's or bachelor's degree. It depends because certain programs require you to have certain things. And that's where you may hear the term, it is a certificate program or a degree program. So like currently ours is just a certificate program. But if you went to paramedic school and you came in and you're like, okay, so we're going to make this a uh, degree program because you have so many hours, da, 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 you can come out with, a, I think it's a bachelor's of science because paramedicine falls under the science program. So uh, or you can get an associate's in the science program. Or, so those are the difference levels that we talked about there. Um, some components of EMS, you have your comprehensive quality uh, care, evidence-based clinical care, efficient, well-rounded care, preventative care, comprehensive and easily accessible patient records. So a lot of my job offshore is doing preventive care. Um, we do COVID testing. Uh, if you arrive on Monday, you test Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then again on the next Monday. So we do, you technically have five COVID tests the day you fly out and you have four on board. So that, yeah, that may be a lot and we catch a lot. Um, my relief told me the other day there was 40 cases in one day that we're off in the Gulf of Mexico. So yeah, we still have COVID, but you remember that it's an, from once I get to my heliport, it's an hour and 45 minute flight. So no matter what, we can only fly one COVID patient at a time. We have three uh, and flying ambulances that respond to the Gulf. So that's a lot. Uh, it, it, it is very time consuming. Uh, that's a, that's a, so that's the reason why we test so much. But I do preventive care. Like it's my job. I go around the platform. I go out there while they're drilling oil. Are you drinking enough water? Hey guys, you need to put some sunscreen on. Make sure you have the right glasses on. Hey, your hard hat's not put on right. I do a lot of that preventive care. Hey man, look, you need to go over here underneath this, this, this shade and this fan and, and just talk. I don't really care. I just don't want them to have to be a patient of mine. So it's easier for me to like take popsicles and pickle pops and water because that's preventive. Now, I do a lot of efficient, well-rounded care because again, like I said, I'm your psychiatrist, the pharmacist. So I, I not only see them for their small issues of like, I got a cut on my finger, but I, I see them if I prescribe medic, if I give them medication, I have to see them so many days and then they have to come back to me to be released. So I not only see in the beginning, I can see them at the end too, which is really cool because not many providers get to see that on the end of it. So that's why I, I really love doing what I do because I get to see some cool stuff. And a lot of time is just a lot of personal injuries. Um, all right, so the 911 system. So let's talk about that. So we know we have the 911 is accessible to the public. Oh, sorry, I was kicking my son over here. The 911 system is a public safety access point. And I'll tell you a little tidbit of information if I didn't know this. Every 911 call in America is routed through one server in the U.S. Does anybody have an idea, guess where that server is located? 
There's some educated people in here. All right. So it is in rural. Uh, nope. It is in rural Alabama. Every car, I don't care if you're in Alaska, New York, you're in Arizona, or the southern tip of Key West. Every 911 call is routed to that server in rural Alabama and then routed back to you. Now, it takes split seconds for that to happen because we have fiber. We have all these cool communication accesses. But every one of those is done through that. And then it's picked up at your local your local 911 dispatch where they say, 911, where is your emergency at? You know, and stuff like that. So each dispatcher is also considered a emergency medical dispatcher once they've been through that training. Not only do they go through, girl, you coughing over there. I wish you good. I see you making sure she good. I thought she about to choke. Um, so they have the 911 dispatch training. They have uh, how to work their system, the different calls. Oh, I, I couldn't do it. There could not be a dispatcher. Well, once they get to another point, they can go through emergency medical dispatcher. What that does in turn is teaches them how to, let's say, they, they give them care. They give them provide like how to do proper CPR to somebody that doesn't know, uh, how to help someone that's choking. And all of it's being done by verbal. They don't get to look at a screen like this where I'm saying, uh, where is it? Let's see, Andrea Robinson, I physically can't see you. We can tell you what's going on at your residence. I can tell you, you need to put your hands in this position. They, they don't have that service as much as available as they do. That is up and coming. I know that like the, uh, what is that, the TDDY, the, for the, the blind people, they can, uh, there's a service that's up and coming to where TTY, that's it. See, I don't know, that's why I'm asking my wife. She's telling me what the real truth is. But those are coming. Uh, you have these apps uh, that allow people to learn how to do CPR. Uh, they have to tell you, they count, they do, you know, I say the best rhythm to do CPR isn't if y'all have ever done it. It's, it's another one. Uh, what is it? Yeah, staying alive. I know that's very bad to say, but staying alive is the best beat to do in CPR to you. Um, but to get back to my story. So it is up and coming to where dispatchers uh, across the country are being able to take FaceTime calls uh, and see what's going on now. I don't know if that's a good thing or it's a bad thing. I, I don't know. But I know that service is up and coming. Uh, I hear it being talked about pretty regularly, but it's very, very expensive. So human resources, we talk about that. What, what is, what's our big thing right now is just getting people to work and, and coming in there because 911 is not, not a highest paying job in the world to be a 911 dispatcher. You, you not paid a lot. It's just, it's a calling that people do and they love it. They get a job, they're like, I don't know what a dispatcher is, but sure, I'll do it. You may answer the dude just holding the gun to his head at two o'clock in the morning, or you may be trying to help a little girl do CPR on a daddy because he choked and now he's not breathing. That's that's emotional draining. I, I couldn't imagine. That's actually how I met my wife. Uh, she was a dispatcher, um, but it, it's emotionally draining. So our dispatchers are not only awesome, but at the same time as you just want to just go through that mic and just punch him in the head. Uh, I wouldn't say that I know that professionally but I can tell you I've wanted to do it a couple of times. So uh, let's look here. So medical direction. So this now let's break it down of what this medical direction is going to do. So a medical direction is a physician. Uh, it's a medical director authorized EMTs to provide medical care in the field. So that doctor is giving you permission to say, you can work underneath my blah, 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 blah number to be an EMT. A medical director is an ongoing working liaison between the medical community, hospitals, and EMTs in the service. There was one medical provider that I had back in the day that he would actually get in a sprint truck and sprint to these calls to see how people that he signed off on that were able, then what they were doing. Were they worth anything? Uh, were they good at it? How did they respond? How did they do anything? And he wasn't going to let you just be a responder without knowing how you did. Um, appropriate care is described in standing orders and protocols. So a doctor will allow you to do certain skills, certain protocols. It allows you to, you can do online protocols or offline. So offline is something that he or she has written. Say, if I'm having shortness of breath, they allow you to uh, provide oxygen. They allow you to do this, 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 and this. 
Now, if it's online medical control orders, it means I'm talking to a doctor and he's telling me to do something. So there is a difference between online and offline. Um, I have online, I have offline protocols that I follow when I'm on an ambulance here in Mississippi. And I have a different set of rules that I follow when I'm offshore. And I can also reach out to the doctor by phone and speak to. Correct. Uh, Mario talks about MedCom. Um, so MedCom is, there's one in Memphis and there's also one in Mississippi, if I'm, if I remember right. So please correct me. So MedCom, that is a general number that you can call to the state and speak to a physician of any any round, most of the time it's an ER docket, but if you need certain type of uh, assistance, they can provide it. Um, I can speak for the Mississippi MedCom. They have access to any particular person that speaks any language, uh, Mandarin Chinese, they can put you somebody that can help translate that. Um, they can help you with air transport. Uh, just some of those technical questions, you're just like, doc, I, 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 don't, I don't know, what do you think? And you can relay those off of them. So those are cool. So providers are not required to consult med control director before implementing standing orders. But if you have that question or like, hey, I gave them sugar water, which is D50. They've eaten. Their sugar levels are, are stable, but they don't want to go to the hospital. I've explained to them, hey, if you don't come to the hospital, receive further treatment, your sugar can drop and you can possibly die because nobody's here with you. You're by yourself. Somebody told us to come check on you. So if you don't go and you're saying that you understand that and you're willing to take that acceptance, I'm going to be like, all right, now that I've said that, let me call the doctor and get permission to leave you here. Because that, uh, that just allows me to say, okay, I've talked to the physician, I gave you, you understand all this, this, and this, we can leave you there. Sometimes a physician may be like, hey, I just need you to bring them into the facility, and that's, that's what I need you to do. So it's good about having online and offline because it gives me ability to do a lot of things without asking permission. I don't need to say, mother, may I, when I can already do that. So just break that down for you guys. Uh, medical control, we talked about online or offline. Um, legislation and regulation. So these are some things that I hope that you get interested in the further that you go because our state legislations and our federal legislations make rule changes. They make all these guidances and different things that, that affects EMS in some form of fashion. Um, like what color ambulances can be, what color lights they can do, how many hours that an EMT can operate before they're required uh, to take a, a, a break. Um, those are certain things that are, that are all required at, at a high legislation level. Uh, it says EMS, each, uh, although each EMS system, medical direction, and training program has some latitude, its training protocols and practices must follow state legislation rules, regulations, and guidances. A senior EMS official is usually in charge of the necessary administrative tasks, such as scheduling, uh, personal, uh, personnel, budget, purchasing, vehicle maintenance. So just because, or uh, let's say like the, the EMS director might be just the, the, the CEO of that area, and then he has the med control doctor, and then he has his his secretary and they have a scheduling person and they have HR and they have all these different tasks that people are assigned to do and maintenance, vehicle maintenance is a, is a huge one. Uh, budgets, personnel is probably the biggest. Um, vehicle maintenance is also one of the bigger ones too. So those also are all required in, e in EMS agencies no matter where you go. So there's so all sorts of, told you y'all, there's all sorts of aspects and everything that you're gonna see in these different companies. So just because you're only seeing one small aspect as a new hire, understand that they get pretty drastically large. Um, integration of health services, uh, pre-hospital care should be continued in the emergency department to ensure that patients receive comprehensive con continuity of care. That's the reason why when I transport somebody, I give a verbal face-to-face -face report once I get to the hospital about my patient. Now, as I'm coming into the facility, I'm gonna give them a radio call and tell them with, I like to say 25 words or less, cause that nurse is just as busy as I am. 
of what's going on, how's things going, and what's the status of the patient. And I'll give you further on arrival. So they know, okay, well, I can, I can semi-triage this patient coming in. And then once they get here, I can fully triage that patient and put them in the right, most appropriate place that they belong. Like, do they need to go to ortho because they have a broken arm versus going to cardiology? Because the report that I took was not what I heard. I thought he said he had, you know, like a cardiac issue instead of a ortho issue. So verbal reports are really important there. Um, mobile integrated health services, uh, method of delivery health care that utilizes pre-hospital spectrum. Uh, MIH involved with goal facilities improve access to health care and an affordable price. Uh, a mobile health integrated health care. Health care is provided with the community rather than a physician's office or hospital. An integrated team of professional care. So I can say like a friend of mine got on a federal contract here recently that once you were uh, diagnosed with COVID, they would come to your home, provide you with the monocrobial uh, infusions that was done at your home versus being done in the ER uh, or what other type of medical care that's in the area. So it doesn't take up the time. They would come to your house, sit outside your house. One provider sit with you. The other three would sit outside and they would take turns. So they're not always in your way. But it happened at your home and it wasn't out of, it wasn't taking up a, a bed in the ER because just because they were COVID positive didn't mean they were symptomatic. They may have been asymptomatic, but just wanted the myocrobial infusion. So cool, that's great. Do it at your home. So that's part of an MIH that's able to come out there. You do have some rural paramedics. Uh, some states allow them to come out and help you with your medicines. You'll do a FaceTime with the doctor like we're doing now. Talk about your medications. They may prescribe medications in the and the paramedic may go out to his ambulance or whatever they're in, get those medications, explain them to you, and, and beyond. Uh, I know some services that do that are really, really good at that, and uh, some that are trying to uh, copy those areas because the, that services is up and going. So again, about the uh, mobile integrated healthcare, is a branch of healthcare is causing an evolution of additional training, which to be a clinician, uh, it, it, it's a lot. I had to go through a lot of training to do what I do now on a platform versus what I do on an ambulance. Uh, community paramedicine is what we talked about. It's the experienced paramedics receive advanced training to equip them to provide services in the community. In addition to the patient care services, a paramedic would typically provide services provided by the community paramedic, maybe uh, health evaluations, monitoring chronic illnesses and conditions, obtaining labs, which I can draw blood and take it to the facility versus them having to come in and sit around and wait and uh, administer certain types of immunizations. Like if they just need a flu shot or they need their COVID vaccines, I can, I can do that on these services, which is now really needed because of how full these, um, these hospitals are becoming. It, it, it's crazy that there's just people use these hospitals that are uh, as their primary physicians when that's not what it's brought out to be. It's a, an emergency room, not a, oh, I'm going to go see Dr. Jones. He's been my physician for 10 years. Well, Dr. Jones is an ER doc. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff we see out there. Uh, information systems, computer systems are used to document patient care, and they are electronically stored and can be used to improve care. Now, what sucks about that is, so if I pick you up with, uh, a ambulance service and Rob picked you up with B ambulance services, our computers don't talk. So we have to get the same information every single time and it's annoying. Now, if I pick you up consistently with a ambulance service, a lot of the times your information will be brought back off our server and I can copy the same information. But again, once I take you to the hospital, our information doesn't transfer over. So it's, it's annoying but it's required that we do that. So when somebody may get aggravated and they're like, why are you asking this thing? You just saw me Monday. Hey man, I get it, but it's not me. It's the computer system. I still gotta get the same information. There's not many services out there anymore that use handwritten reports. Uh, maybe if the computer system has gone down, they may have to go back computer reports. I remember when that's all we had, that was dangerous because not a lot of us can write real well. Um, 
but these informations are stored to uh, the a server that it transfers over into billing, helps get the money back and forth to these agencies. Um, evaluations, the medical director is responsible for maintaining quality control within, within the EMS system. So they may have certain classes that you're required to attend. Like uh, there may be a new tool that's coming out like the, um, the IO, which is interosseous. So it means it's, it's a needle that goes into your bone instead of an IV that goes into your vein and going there. They may be getting a new certain type of IO needle and everybody has to go through that class because the medical, direct, medical director has required that. Um, adoption of this culture, uh, it, what this does is promotes a, a learning culture that holds employees accountable. I want you to be accountable for the care that you provide. Because once you're held accountable, that allows you to take better, sorry, my dog decided she wanted some dinner too. So it, it helps you get better. Uh, it makes you want to maintain a higher level of care when you're held responsible. Um, and it makes you want to improve yourself, okay? Because these people in your community know you uh, and they rely on you to take and give them the best, uh, utmost best care. Uh, the CQI, which is the quality control improvement. Sorry, hang on one second. Wherever my... My dog's going to end up getting beat here in a minute with my wife. All right, so a CQI reviews and performs audits in the EMS system to identify areas of improvement or assign medical remedi remedial training. So if I start giving a lot of IVs and I miss a lot of the IVs, I mark successful or unsuccessful. And then if they start realizing that I've started missing 30 and 40% of my IVs, they may require me to go to additional training. Okay, that's fine. Because what it's doing is it's, it's helping me get better. It's going to make me improve my, my medical treatment. And it it helps minimize the errors when it comes to that, because I may need that IV during a cardiac emergency and I just can't do it. So the doctor's like, okay, at a 30% miss ratio, we want all of our, all of our paramedics to go back through our retraining. Um, and it says it uses a, a plan, do, study, act cycle. As you can see here, it's like you plan it, you do it, uh, you study it and you act on it. Um, like I like to use the see one, do one, teach one. I expect you to watch me how to do something. You're gonna do one and then you teach me how you did it. So basically I, you do it a three form way is I wanna make sure that you see how it's done. I wanna make sure that you're doing it right. And I want you to teach me the way it is done. That's just the way that I like to train. Um, anytime I have new people or even on the ambulance, I want you to see one, do one, teach one. It's just a method that I've stuck with over years it's just something that works for Chris Wally. That's why I like to do it that way. Um, patient safety. So we minimize medical errors that include a result of the rules-based failure, a knowledge-based failure, or a skill-based failure, or a combination of any of these. I'm sorry, my wife's trying to beat my dog and she's hiding underneath my feet. So I'm trying to laugh at the dog and at my wife at the same time. So requires efforts of both EMS agencies and EMS personnel. So. I want the utmost safety for this patient. Not only did they call 911 because they needed something. We never see people in the best time of their lives. We're not called, 911's not called for us to come to their weddings. It should not happen. Sometimes they call us at the deliveries, but most time it's still an emergency because we're doing a field delivery. We're not there to celebrate the birth. We're there to deliver the baby and then we give them a bill. But we're not always out there to see these people at the best times of their life. But what we are there for is to provide care for them. So what we want to do is provide the utmost safest care that we can. And sometimes that doesn't happen because we may get in a wreck on the way to the hospital. Uh, I've seen a lot of things happen. Don't ask a lot of questions. But we need both provider both providers to buy into that statement of we're providing the best safety out there for this patient because now we're going to do that is I want to go home the same way that I came to work in I want to go see my family at the end of the day plus I want to make a difference out there in people's lives 
So we talk about uh, financing systems. Uh, finance systems vary depending on which organization is involved. Personnel may be paid, they may be volunteer, or kind of a mixture of each. EMTs may be asked to gather insurance information, signatures, and obtain written permission from uh, patient, patients to perform billing insurance. Like all of us want to get paid. Like people want us to pay them. So I want to go to work to be paid. Now, if I went and drove an ambulance all day long and didn't get a single billing information, I didn't get a single signature or even an address of where I picked somebody up at or where to send the bill, my service is not going to collect money, which means eventually they're not going to be able to pay me. I, my family requires a lot. There's five of us. It, I mean, I need to get paid just as much as you. So when you go out there and do these things, you're not only you gathering personal information, but you're getting date of births, you're getting social, you're getting a lot of these informations that's, that's restricted underneath HIPAA that you can't, like if I take care of my next door neighbor, the other neighbor comes and asks me what's going on. If I release that information, that neighbor I took care of can, can sue me for releasing personal information. So HIPAA protects that saying, I, I can't release that information and it protects that patient. So with us getting all these informations, we were held to a higher level of standards of care because now I have your personal information. There are some dirty people out there in every company agency in the world that take these information and go out and does God knows. But I, I, I want to go to sleep with a clear conscience. I'm not doing that because it's not going to come back to me. I, I think I look good in orange, but I don't want to look in an orange jumpsuit if y'all know what I'm saying. Because now I've created a felony and I've stolen piece of people's information. So you have to be cautious about that. So when you get this information, now we're turning it in to the company so they can bill information out. Well, we're responsible for gathering that information. Um, in 2020, the Centers for Medical, uh, Centers, Centers for Medicare and Medical, Medicaid Services, CMS, implemented a pilot program called Emergency Triage, Treat and Transport. ET3 strives to reimburse EMS systems for providing the right patient care at the right time. Set up a payment model for patients, uh, patient transport to alternate destinations, such as urgent care centers or doctor's offices or on-scene treatment with no transport. So before every single patient we took had to go to the hospital for us to receive money. If I showed up to a, an MVC, and got a motor vehicle collision and got a signature saying, no, I don't wanna go to the hospital. I'm still providing a care and service. I gotta get paid for it. So a lot of services would bill you to say, no, I didn't wanna go because I came, assessed you and allowed you to sign. Well, people were like, what, 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 what? And well, then over time, our ER started getting fuller and fuller and then more full and eventually they're like, you're going to be holding the wall for seven hours. Whoa, we, time out. A fire department can't let an ambulance transport and sit there for seven hours because now there's no ambulance in that district. And the same thing for an ambulance service. There's no, after a while, there's no ambulances on the street. And just first responders don't want to drive that patient up there and sit for seven hours because their full-time job is just like hanging up here in limbo, just waiting on them to come back. So, uh, the, C the ET3 has allowed has some areas to where you can say, okay, well, you just need stitches or an x-ray, and you can go to the urgent care to get that. Um, we can take you to a doctor's office because you really just got, you just need to see by a doctor and give some prescriptions and you can go back home. Or we can do, like I said earlier, I can give somebody some sugar get their sugar up high enough and get them to transport. I mean, not transport them, sign or refuse them, leave them at home, but I can still send a bill for all of that because that's a, a service that I provided. And Medicaid and Medicare has agreed to pay for those services now versus before they just wouldn't do that because it takes the stress off of these medical facilities, the EDs, the ERs, whatever you want to call them, to see other more critical patients. So the education system. So let's talk about this here. So EMS instructors are licensed in most states, which I am licensed in multiple states. 
most EMS training programs adhere to the national standards established by two accrediting organizations. You have your com committee on accrediting of e educational programs for the EM emergency medical service professions, which is the co-AEMSP and the commissions on accreditation of allied health education programs, which is the C CAAHEP. Frequent continuing education, refresher courses, and computer-based or mannequin-based self-education exercises are measures intend to maintain and update EMT's knowledge and skills. I'm also held to a higher level of care that I have to go through training on education, how to stay up to the utmost, what the level of care is, what they're teaching now. I have to learn it so I can go out there and teach it. Every provider that's in the education world is held to a higher level because I'm trying to teach you what to do. I want to make sure I teach you the right stuff. So we have to go through continuing ed training. Uh, we do a lot of stuff in-house at ARI. Um, my company also provides me to be instructors in some other courses that I'm also required to. I still have to do my refresher for my paramedic every two years. So that's something, some other training and education that I have to sit through. Uh, prevention and public education. Really what I'll just break this down easy is there's not enough public education on how to uh, protect yourself, as in like first aid. No, that's why we push big first aid courses and classes. A lot of people have to search to find those in those areas versus people coming out there because it is, it is hard to, to do that as a business person to go out and say, hey, I offer these services. Out of 10 people I may talk to, I may have one. That's still one different. So it. It's, you got to have the emphasis on prevention. So it's kind of like fire prevention week. You only do that once in the fire service. You only do it once a year. Well, why do you do that? Well, one is it costs money to do that. It costs time. Firemen have to take the time from the stations to go do it. Got to have the education material. It, it, over a while, it dissolves around money. Well, it's like mental health care. If you had enough people to come out there and try to help, with the mental health, we wouldn't have as much issues as we do in the medical side, hospitals, uh, state facilities. We don't have that education out there that can help do that. So basically is the prevention and this the primary prevention and, and just the going and forth of education on how to take care of being proactive versus reactive that helps with the EMS system. Um, so here's a table of uh, samples of public health accomplishment, accomplishments. I'm gonna let y'all I want to read that while I drink some tea here. So we've had millions of dollars talked about all of that. We have our FDA. We know every ATV that's sold in America, they make money off of, the, off of that. It helps pay for helmets. Um, every motorcycle... There's uh, goes in uh, part of that, the ATVs, the motorcycles. There's a part of that sales that goes into a state trauma fund, which pay which helps pay these medical facilities uh, some funds that they don't receive off of traumas. Uh, let's say maybe the person uh, passed away. Uh, some of the money off of this out of the trauma fund can help go pay some of that medical bill for these facilities so they don't lose out a uh, hundred percent there. Um, EMS research, we have uh, evidence-based uh, medicine. Uh, it's focused on procedures that have proven useful and, and improving patient outcomes. Like I know it's tried and true. Um, let's, let's talk about hot topic. Let's say why, what COVID vaccine over the other? Well, there's not enough EBM out there right now to tell you which one's better than the other one. There's a lot of skepticism versus getting vaccinated, unvaccinated, it doesn't matter what you as an individual choose to me, just make a best educated decision for yourself and or your family. That's evidence-based medicine, is I know that epinephrine will help the patient that's in a cardiac situation with their heart rate. So that's why we give epi. We have taken atropine out of it because we know that atropine can or can't. So, but we know epi is because They've tried it for years and years and years, and it's, it's always worked. Many EMS systems and states consult the national model EMS clin uh, clinical guidelines from the National Association of State EMS Officials. 
Uh, guidelines are based on a review of current research and expert consensus. So those fill out this, those reports, um, they may pull 7,000 EMS reports from Mississippi and study why uh, taking off a helmet in the field versus leaving the helmet on, which one had the most survivability rate? Well, that's evidence-based. Well, maybe was it because of the EMS side or was it once they made it to the facility that did it da So those are parts of the studies that they look into. Uh, yes, I promise you we're almost done for this evening. I know I told you it wasn't gonna take super long. Uh, roles for EMTs. Uh, EMTs are healthcare uh, professionals, whether paid or volunteer. The roles and responsibilities of EMTs, uh, they keep the vehicle and equipment ready for emergency. So not only do we use it, we have to clean it up and restock it. So if we use something that gets blood, it gets bloody all over it, it gets, that gets bloody, we have to clean it and put it back into service. Now we have to sterilize it and all those other things. So ensure your safety, your partner's safety, the patients and the bystander. We need to make sure that it's safe for us to go in, it's safe for us to provide care and it's safe to remove them out of it. Be you familiar with your emergency vehicle operation? What, at what winds does this, uh, if most of the ambulances say it's a box truck, so it's like, it looks like a bread truck. Let's, everybody knows what a bread truck is. At what winds that are out there, let's say a tornado is coming through, can I drive this ambulance? Well, most of your box trucks, uh, your state law of Mississippi, if it's 55 mile an hour sustained wind, no ambulances are allowed on the, on the highways or roadways, period. Because anything higher than that, it's not safe. Most times those ambulances do tump over because they are, uh, I mean, they, they do get top heavy, um, but a lot of it is is on the wheels and axles that are the heavy part. Be an on-scene leader. Is it time for you to just be like, okay, we'll find, we'll, you know, whatever they decide, fire department's going to get them out, we'll take them to the hospital. Or does it need you just looking at it and you're like, oh, what is going on? I, I, who, who's in charge? Well, maybe you. Maybe your time to step up and say, I need you to do this, you do that, you do this, and you bring them to me, I will take them from here. And you're going to do evaluations on scene. You make sure, be like, hey, who's in charge of safety over there? See it from the 100-foot view versus the one-on-one -on -one view, because a lot of times we get blinders when we go into these emergencies, and we don't see the true uh, dangers out there. So sometimes we need to take a step back. Building our scene evaluation and our scene safety starts from the time that we're dispatched. So you start building uh, what's going on, what's potentially out there, what I need to look for, just by what you're dispatched to. Do we need to call for additional resources? Do we need help? Well, there's a Greyhound bus that's overturned. Ah, I can't take care of all of them. I'm going to need some help. Um, gain patient access. Whose job is that? Most of the time, it is your fire department services, your fire department's job to gain access, either by extrication, rope access, they have to go down into the trench. It's their job to do that. Perform a patient assessment. You at least need to have an EMT or a paramedic providing these services, uh, assessment, sorry. EMR, I am not knocking them whatsoever. So we can do EMR, EMT, or, or paramedic making these assessments. Give emergency medical care to the patient while awaiting the arrival of additional medical resources. We are gonna provide triage. We're gonna say, okay, we need to give the most amount of care to this, like triage goes uh, red, yellow, green, or black. Well, the most critical ones are gonna, the ones that are gonna go out first. Well, they need some care until the other service uh, ambulances get there and they can transport them to the hospital. Give emotional support. Sometimes people just need to talk. And you sit there and listen to them, and you're writing your report. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, or typing your report. I, I understand. Yes, sir. It's okay, sir. It's okay to cry. Let's, let's let it out. It's, sir. I, I, yes, sir. A lot of times, people just need to hear that. Sometimes it's okay for you to be emotionally involved. Um, if you feel it, and you, you're maybe emotionally attached. Uh, you get a family member just latches onto you, and you're like, ah, yeah. Don't just kind of push them away. They, they need those. Uh, especially other responders. As you'll learn as we go through this, a lot of medical responders just don't, they don't talk about it. Um, if things bother them or affect them, you kind of find out after the fact. Now, is that good for us to find out that way? Most of the time it's not. Uh, we should find out. Um, when I work the streets, I, I particularly work with one person. Uh, she's a good friend of mine, plus 
Uh, there's times I've opened up and be like, look, that that call bothered me. I, I need to get I need a minute. Um, uphold mercy and legal standards. Abide by the HIPAA. Don't talk about it. Um, if you transported a patient and then Sunday at church, somebody's asking you, be like, hey, what happened, you know, other day when you were transported such and such? Man, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. But they, they're at the hospital. You know, are they going to be okay? I, I really don't know. I had to leave before anything was done. The patient was put on. Uh, we just put him in the room, and I don't know what all happened after that. Um, ensure and protect the patient's privacy. That's somebody's sister, mother, daughter, father, son, dad. I mean, it, it's so mainstream. Like, if you're doing, if you have to do CPR in the middle of Walmart, I don't care where y'all are in the country, everybody knows about Walmart. You need to make sure that you have somebody on every end of the aisle or holding up a sheet. So if you're having to, you know, take their top off or, you know, cut their bra off so you can do CPR, you, you need to hold their, their, their privacy. Um, again, that's somebody's family member. Um, so that may be like, hey, so I need y'all to hold the sheet up on that end and y'all hold that sheet on that end because I got I to gotta remove this off of him. Uh, just, just, you know, their privacy is the most important thing too because, you know, think about if we deal with a kid that may, uh, let's say they urinated on themselves because they had a seizure. That's that's really traumatic to them. To us in their gender, you're like, you know what? It's just pee. Somebody will get you a new pair of jeans in just a minute. But to that child, and depending on what age group they're in, that's a very traumatic situation to them. Um, let's see here. Give administ uh, administrative support. Constantly continue your professional development. Uh, cultivate and sustain community relations, give back to the profession. I'm really big on education, even if it's to the public. Um, if you look good in uniform, you dress nice, your clothes don't look like a bag of garbage, like you just pulled them out of the bottom pile of the that's been there for a month, people are going to respect you by the way you look. Look professional, act professional, people will treat you professionally. Uh, give back to the profession. I, here I am, I'm, I'm trying to educate people to come into the profession and to move forward. To me, that's, that's, it's, it's rewarding to myself. Uh, some people are not into being educators. Uh, a lot of times people are just saying they like to educate by having new people on their truck and teaching them new things. That's cool. That's 100% their lane, their road, their happiness. I'm cool with that. Um, we talked about looking, uh, looking professional, uh, appearance and hygiene, man, you know, again, I, I, I say this, to, I can say this and everybody will understand, don't look like a bag of ass when you walk into somebody's house, because they'll be like, what you, what you doing? You, you know, your shirt ain't even tucked in or your shoes tied. You gonna come in here and take care of me? Nah, bro, I'm good. Y'all go on. I'll get my wife taking me. So look professional. I, I, like I said, I, I don't know how else to say that very nice, but a bag of butts just don't look sound as well as y'all know what I'm trying to talk about. But be empathy, uh, show empathy. Make sure you like you know don't just be like just a broken arm. You'll be fine. Quit crying. Sometimes it's okay to be like, hey, bro, look, I broke mine in third grade too, and I cried way worse than you. So I, it's okay to be a big baby, but just don't tell nobody, please. So you have to relay those things. So self confidence, knowing what you know, what knowing what you know. And knowing what you do is a big part of it. If you're, again, acting professional, people will respect that. If you walk in there and you'll be like, I, I don't know, this is my first day on the job. I like to do that when I go and have somebody in the back of my ambulance. I'm like, I don't, whew, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. I'm trying to start this IV. This is my first day on the truck. So please bear with me. Well, what it does is it helps take your nerves away. Because I'm like, no, nah, bro, I've been doing this 20 years. It's okay. And they're like, whew, man, I'm about to have a panic attack. Th that's okay. That's how I deal with things. It may not be your realm on how to deal with certain things. All right, so two more slides, I promise y'all. Time management, performing or delegating multiple tasks while ensuring efficiency and safety. Um, communication, understanding others and making yourself understood to others. Teamwork, um, being able to work with others, knowing your place within a team communicating while giving respect to the listener. That's a big part. Having your patient tell you what's wrong and be like, okay, so let me make sure I got this right. You're having trouble breathing. You've had trouble breathing. You, were, you have this, you have that. 
that lets that patient know that you that you're being that they're being heard and you're relaying back to them that they are. I like to take notes. I write all over my gloves. So that way I can make, okay, hang on. You're 26 years old. You're born on this date, first and last name. You're allergic to this, this, and this. That makes sure that I have the right information. Be that patient's advocacy. Speak for that person. Consistently keep the needs of that patient as the center of care. What does that patient need? I like to argue with when I get to the hospital, if they don't want to listen to me, I'm like, no, you need to understand this patient needs this, this, and this. They may not be able to talk to you right now, but when they come together, they're not going to be happy because I'm telling you, I like to be the patient advocacy. I, I, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm a confrontational person and I'm comfortable with making sure that that patient receives what they're supposed to. And then care for delivery of care or carefully deliver of care, paying attention to the details, making sure that's what is being done for the patient is done as safely as possible. Like driving to and from the emergency scene is the most dangerous part of this. Driving to the hospital with lights and sirens is the most dangerous because people are all like, look, an ambulance, woo, and there's a wreck right in front of you. You're like, now I can't go because you just wrecked. So be driving and being careful is the most important part too. Uh, most patients will treat you with respect. Some are not always going to respect you, period. Uh, yet every patient is entitled to compensation, respect, and the best care you can provide. I don't care if I don't like you, I'm still going to give you the best care. I don't have to like you, care for you, or love you to give you the best care that I can do because every single patient I get will get the best same level of care across the board. I don't care male, female, race, color, don't matter. I've been in the, I've been in the other parts of this country or I've been in the Middle East and I've taken care of people. It doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt my feelings at all. Patient privacy must be protected no matter what. Uh, findings or disclosures may be made to the patient as soon as discovered. Uh, who's those treating the tooth with who to the treating the patient? If they're like, is my leg broke? Like, you, you're missing your foot. They may not be happy to hear that, but a lot of times honesty is the best. They're like, what? That's there. No. Cuff, you, you're missing your foot. So a lot of the times you need to relay those to the people there. Uh, protection of the patient. Privacy has drawn national attention with the passage of the health, insurance, probability, and accountability. That, that's the HIPAA that we all talk about. Um, Scott, I have in, uh, let's see, question in regarding the appearance policy. I noticed you have tattoos. Are you forced to curve them? No, uh, I'm not. I don't know. I have them all over. Um, so offshore, I am not required to cover those. I'm covered here. I got them on my wrist. I don't have any on my neck and all that. Facial hair. Um, I'm not supposed to have it this long, but where I'm currently at, certain agencies will require certain things. So let me let me address that way. I can tell you who I work for does not. They're not against that. You can have hand tattoos. Doesn't really matter. Um, I worked with a guy that's had. I mean, his, his his from here, like his beard line down, was covered. Hands, all that. One of the best paramedics I ever worked with in my life. And people were like, what's he doing? I'm like, that's your paramedic, bro. He's awesome. Um, so to me, I, a tattoo is not going to make any difference. If you save my life, I could care less. I may come together and be like, hey, bro, what's, what's on your neck? I, mean, what just, is it? I like to know people's meanings. Um, I work in an area to where we have a Catholic hospital. And that, as you all know, in that religion, a lot of Catholic, uh, we had nuns still make rounds. That was not... Nope. If you work for that hospital, you ain't mm -mm, you ain't having visible tattoos. They just changed that policy, and you were like, "Oh God, the world's shaking. Something's happening." The sisters are allowing the, you know, the tattoo policy. So, no, it, everywhere I work, just they've never said anything about that. Um, I have personal ideas about uh, tattoos and piercings and all that. I don't want you to walk up and grab earrings in my ear. That's a personal thing. I work with people on the streets that have gauges, diamonds, I, nose rings. That's that's cool. That's you. I just I, I don't I don't like to see my own blood. I'm not gonna die from it. I'm not gonna you know faint from it. You do what you gotta do, bro. Uh, it depends on what agency you go to. Some fire departments, uh, police department may say, hey, you have to cover them when you go out in public. Uh, okay. So a lot of people keep sleeves around. They just slide them up. Some people just want to keep them covered. It, 
depends on what agency it doesn't matter to, uh, on that part now nationally some that have to be really ballsy of somebody to make that as a as a big federal like you can't have visible tattoos in the ems world that oh there'll be a lot of lawsuits on that um but again it depends on what particular service you go to work for um on what they require and what they don't acquire um i know that there is a i don't know if we have anybody in here from new york but there's a i want to say it's a presbyterian hospital up there that they wear all white and uh i know that you you can't have any visible tattoos for that but that that's that particular service if that's where you want to work you just have to provide by that you know some places are like hey you got to wear a three-piece suit to come here and we sell cars you're like to sell cars you want me a three-piece suit you want to work here that's what you got to do um so that is the end of chapter one for the night. Does anybody have any questions? So y'all can kind of see how we build from here. Um, you will not be able to take your chapter test tonight. I will have it fixed by tomorrow at some point. I will send out a Discord note telling everybody, hey, look, you know, your chapter has been unlocked. Um, remember, you will have uh, Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday, Friday. It will lock on Friday at midnight, and you will not be able to take it again. Um, if you miss a class or if you're having trouble, you haven't got your book in time, please send me enough, send me a message on Discord, send me an email, and I can tell you, sometimes I forget. I, I'm human. I, I forget a lot, a lot of times. Uh, what, what time class over for? So most of the time, I am not one of those who's going to keep you all forever. I'm not going to say, oh, we're allotted from six to ten. If it's over in an hour and 10 minutes, it's over. Uh, it's just what it is. Uh, some nights are longer. Some nights are like, we have like three breaks and everybody gets tired of listening to me. Um, I do want to reiterate something. Please, 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 please communicate with me. Um, if you don't communicate with me and I can't find emails, I can't find Discord messages, because in Discord, you can also private message me um if i can't find any of that and you come back to me and be like hey wiley look i let you know uh i don't delete messages i still have messages in discord from my first class i don't i don't delete them i don't delete emails yes my wife's in there hollering at me um if there's a computer issue uh let's say your screen your your shit just died uh jb learning won't let you in or anything that's technical issues Take a screenshot with your phone, send it to me. I don't care if you email it. I don't care if you ain't going to text me, but I, I don't care. Send those to me. And that I always, always rule on the side of the student. But I'm not, I'm not going to give it to you. Uh, you're going to work for this program, uh, just like I did. Um, as y'all will notice, these modules, I become harder as we go. So for the first module, uh, I'll be a little more lenient. Second and third module, we start cracking down. Um, it, by the third module, I'm not going to say I won't cut you any slack, but you won't get three and four test retakes. Um, what it is now is it's you get you get one test. Uh, initially, it's unlocked for you. For the second time, if you have to retake a test to pass, you must do a chapter overview, and you must email it to me. I read it. That's a lot to read. Trust me, I know. And then I think that you have the basis of it, or I want to ask you a couple of questions, I will. And then I will reopen the second attempt. That's all you get, period. No more. Um, I just, um, two students from the last class uh, asked for an extension on their final. It's a new year. Class ended the 1st of December. I just failed them tonight before this class started because they didn't retake their finals. And they have to take the whole EMT course over again. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not a hard ass, but I will help you every single time if you communicate with me. That's all I ask. Um, I'm an over communicator. Um, I don't expect everybody to over communicate like I do, but uh, if that's something that you feel shared to, I'm okay with that because uh, all it can do is be in the benefit of you. Uh, 99% of the time, I, I'll make the best decision I can. If it's something that I just don't feel comfortable in making a decision because who knows why, I'll call Rob and be like, hey, Rob, look, I have a situation. 
I, I just need some extra help. Um, even though I am the instructor and the EMS coordinator, I, a lot of times if this, let's say there's an issue between one of you and I, and it's just not going anywhere, I automatically will call Rob and be like, hey, I, I need to bow out. I need you to make a decision because I think we need to make the best decision for this, this student. And it's not, it's not me. I, I will. Now, in some of the other classes we have, their problems come to me and I, I make a decision and that's where it's at. But I won't do that as your instructor. I, I make the best decision I can and then it's up to Rob. But Rob bow in sometimes in classes and jump in and just say, hey, how's it doing? Touch up with everybody. But that's about it. Um, that's me in a nutshell. You've seen the class. Uh, we will meet Thursday night. Uh, we'll do about the same thing. We'll go over the lecture. Uh, we'll, do, we'll talk about it. Uh, your class, your test will open at 10 o'clock on Thursday night. I'll have your test fixed for tom by tomorrow for the lecture tonight. Uh, other than that, please write this code down. Your code for tonight is AMQ390. Um, that is also your attendance code. Um, I, uh, I also type it into the text. Oh, sorry, whoever's at Pasagula, I just sent you that direct message. Hi. But just in case you needed it, I sent it to everybody. Uh, AMQ390. So it's also, this is recorded and the chat is also kept on the cloud, wherever the heck the cloud is. Um, you can go back and watch this video at any point in time. If you get ready to take your module exam and you're like, ah, crap, I don't remember what he said about module one or chapter one. Go back and watch it again. Sorry you have to listen to me twice, but that's it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Anything that I can help you with? Um, if that, if you, if you don't have any questions, you're more than welcome to bow out. Have a good night. I will mute my computer. I'll turn the camera off. I'll sit here for about 10 minutes. Um, if y'all have questions, I'll pop back in and I'll talk to you. If not, thank y'all for coming. I will see y'all Thursday night. So we go back to the other page to put this code in. So I had to stop. I wanted to make sure I stopped recording. Stand by.